So, the format for today.
And that's why within every single human being, those who believe in it and those who deny it, those who believe in the existence of God and those who deny the existence of God, within inside every single one of them, they always believe or have the attachment and connection between them and someone who is superior than mankind. And that someone is who we refer to as Allah. Islam comes and corresponds, <coughs> conforms with the spiritual element and its natural instinct. Islam comes and it corresponds with it to believe in the oneness of God, in the monotheism of Allah and the monotheism of Islam. That there is no one worthy to be worshipped except Allah. And there is no deity to him. There is no associate, there is no associate or partners with him. There is no someone who is comparable or someone alike him. As Allah says in the Holy Quran, Laysa Kabithi no one is like Allah, no one is similar to Allah, no one is powerful like Allah, no one is knowledgeable like Allah, no one is strong as Allah, no one is powerful as Allah, and no one has that superiority like Allah Almighty. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentions that in his hadith, in his traditions, where he says in the famous tradition that every baby that is born, is born a Muslim. And when we say the word Muslim, we do not refer to a cult or a group. We refer to the nature of this human being, that he surrenders to God, and that's why his name is a Muslim. Someone who surrenders and submits to God. <coughs> Every baby is born, is born a Muslim. Every baby is born, is born a Muslim. Regardless from which family this baby is born from. Then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he says that the parents, the parents of this baby will change his religion. Until one day Allah will guide this baby, or until one day Allah guides this person who was originally to be a Muslim from childbirth, Allah guides him to Islam, and that's why we refer to, refer to them as reverts, not converts. We refer those who recently embraced Islam as reverts, not converts. And the reason that we call them reverts is because they were originally to be Muslims when they were born as Muslims. We as Muslims, we are called Muslims and this is the name that Allah called us. And this is the name that Allah had named us. It's because we surrender to His will. We surrender to His commands. We follow His path. Therefore, because we surrender, we are Muslims. And the word Muslim means someone who surrenders. And at the end of the day, every single one of us is surrendering to something. Whether we surrender to something good or something evil. But me as a human being, I am commanded by Allah, ordained by Allah to surrender to what pleases Allah, which is the good part. And because of this action that I surrender to Him, I am called someone who surrenders and as someone who submits, a submitter. And that's what we refer to be a Muslim. We are not Muhammadanism. We refuse that name to be called upon us. We are not those who name themselves anything else except what we name ourselves after the actions that Allah had commanded us, and that action is to submit to His will, to submit to His commands, to submit to His power, to submit to His call, and that's why we are submitters, and that's what the meaning of a Muslim is, and the religion that we submit to is called Islam, and that's what submission is. So the word Islam means submission. And the reality is, every single human being is submitting to someone or to something. Whether I submit to something I believe in, or something that someone else believes, believes in, or I submit to something good, or I submit to something bad, at the end of the day, Allah commands us to submit to Him because He is our Creator, and we are Muslims because we submit to Him, and the religion that we follow is called submission, and that's Islam. <coughs> Islam means submission. Islam means surrender. Submission and surrender and adherence to the will of God. And Allah had sent prophets and messengers. Allah had sent prophets and messengers. Prophets and messengers that can connect people to Him. These prophets and messengers are human beings and never ever went above the level of being a human being. 
Allah created them like the rest of human beings. Adam loved and clay as he created Adam, as the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he says that every, sing, uh, every single one of us is from Adam, and Adam is created from mud and clay or mud and dust. Allah had sent prophets and messengers. <coughs> All these prophets and messengers are human beings. They do not exceed the level of being a human being. And that includes Adam, includes Noah, includes Abraham, includes Moses, includes Jesus, and includes Muhammad, peace be upon them all. They are all prophets, they are all messengers, but before the prophecy, before the messenger, they are all human beings. And Allah Almighty, He mentions that many times in the Holy Quran, and emphasizes more on Muhammad, peace be upon him, that He says, well, إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرْ say that I am a human being. I am only a human being. So Allah makes it clear to us that these prophets and messengers that Allah sends on His behalf, to speak on His behalf, and Allah strengthens them with miracles that's out of the ordinary of the nature of mankind and different miracles that appeared on the hands of the prophets and the messengers that we know a lot, a lot of them, such as the miracle of Moses, peace be upon him, of the stick turning to snake, and Allah Almighty opening the sea for him, for his people to walk through it, and Jesus in which Allah gave him the miracle of healing the, the ill and bringing the dead back alive. And Muhammad same was that Allah gave him similar miracles to Moses and Jesus and other miracles that appeared on his hands. These are miracles only to strengthen the call of the prophets and the messengers and it's only a proof and evidence to the same call that all prophets and messengers came with and that's to worship Allah and no one else. To worship Allah and no one else. We as Muslims believe that every prophet and messenger that was sent by Allah, he was sent by Allah to call to Allah and the worship of Allah and no one else. That includes Muhammad, that includes Jesus, that includes Moses, that includes every single prophet before Muhammad, as we believe 114,000 prophets and messengers being sent beginning with Adam and ending with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah be pleased upon them all and may Allah send His blessings and peace upon them all. So me as a Muslim, I must believe in the call of Muhammad and the call of all the prophets and the messengers before him. <coughs> we reject, and Islam rejects someone who says, I only believe in Muhammad and disbelieve in the prophets and messengers before him. He is not a Muslim, those who deny the prophecy of Jesus. He is not a Muslim, those who deny the prophecy of Moses. He is not a Muslim, those who deny the prophecy of Abraham. We believe in them and submit and surrender to Allah that Allah had sent them all. But the last and final prophet and messenger that was sent to mankind was Muhammad. And that's why we follow him and we follow his last teachings that was revealed to him. As you might have a Prime Minister now, previously you had another Prime Minister before. It does not mean the Prime Minister before was invalid or it was void. But this is the Prime Minister that you have now. This is the one that you follow right now. In Australia, 20 years ago, we used to have the note, dollar, the note dollar, the, uh, the, the dollar that we used to have, the note used to be made out of paper. Now it's made out of plastic. 20 years ago, it doesn't mean that the notes that were made out of paper, they were incorrect. They were correct, but something new came along, so we followed what recently came, and what recently came to mankind was the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which means it abrogates everything before it and we continue what comes after it. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent by Allah to people, it does not mean that the message that Jesus came with was wrong. Jesus came with the same call of Muhammad. But the recent one that came was Muhammad and therefore we follow the teachings of Muhammad and we continue with what Allah had recently revealed to us. We also believe that Allah is the one that revealed the Bible to Isa, to Jesus salam, and He is the one that revealed the Torah, the Old Testament to Moses, peace be upon him. And we also believe that Allah revealed the Quran to Muhammad But the difference between them, all those three of them are the words of God and three of them call to one objective and call to the worship of one Lord 
We believe that the previous books before the Quran have been distorted, and this is something that no one can disagree over. This is someone that no one can disagree over, that there's so many different Bibles, so many different Old Testaments, but when it comes to the Quran, there's only one. There's only one, the same words that were revealed to Muhammad 14 centuries ago are exactly the same words that we recite these days and they'll continue to be the exact same words to be recited to the end of time. And therefore we follow the Quran that was revealed to Muhammad in Arabic, revealed by Allah to Muhammad in words and content. Muhammad did not put any of those words together and Muhammad did not put any of the content of the Quran together. It was solely revealed by Allah to Muhammad. What Muhammad had to do is only, only deliver the message that Allah had revealed to him. And that's the Holy Quran and the teachings that Allah had shown Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everything the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, everything the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam did, and everything the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam endorsed are all being confirmed and accepted by Allah Almighty. Even though that Muhammad وسلم, will be in a situation that he needs to give a quick answer, if he gives the right answer, Allah will endorse him, and if he gives the incorrect answer, Allah will correct him. And Allah Almighty he says in the Quran Kareem, Allah Almighty says in the Holy Quran, if Muhammad Muhammad, the Prophet and the Messenger of Allah, the one that's delivering the Quran Karim to people, if Muhammad fabricates anything from his own, or says anything from his own, or makes or adds anything extra on the Quran Karim, Allah says, will destroy Muhammad. These are powerful words. To who? To Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to show the authenticity of the Quran Karim that Muhammad didn't come up with anything from his own. If Muhammad did come up with something from his own, what would he say something like this about himself? Have you ever read a book that an author says in that book that if I say this, I'm going to be doing this to myself? Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu she says, By Allah, if the Qur'an al-Kareem or anything from the Qur'an al-Kareem was from Muhammad or anything to do with Muhammad putting it together, the first verse that Muhammad will take away was that verse that I recited to you earlier. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does not say anything from his own. Everything comes from Allah to him. وَمَا يَنْتِقَ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٍ يُوحَى Muhammad does not say anything from his own or from his own desires. It is only a revelation that Allah reveals to him. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a human being that lived like the rest of the human beings, that ate like the rest of the human beings, that drank like the rest of the human beings, and got even married like the rest of the human beings. And he died like the rest of the human beings. And that's why as a Muslim, Islam teaches me to grow up to the principles of Islam, not the individuals that came with Islam. Islam is a religion of principles. A religion of principles. A religion of legislations that we need to grow up to and implement in our lives. And continue implementing that until we face Allah Almighty. And every single person is responsible for their actions. Every single person will be accounted and every single person will be accounted and responsible for their action. No one else will be responsible for the actions of others. And it's not just that Allah will count someone and Allah will judge someone and an action of someone else. So someone will commit a crime and someone else will pay the price. Or someone will commit a crime and then someone else will be the reason that Allah forgives him. That's not just and that's never just. That's not just that one of my children commits a crime and the other one is the one that pays the price. Or the other one is the one that gets locked up. That's not just. That's not logically just and that's not mentally accepted. And that's why in Islam, every single person is responsible for their action. You are responsible for your action. You are responsible for what you believe in. And you are responsible for what you gain. You are responsible when you stand in front of Allah. <coughs> and no one will be responsible for the responsibility of someone else. No one will be responsible for the sins of someone else. No one will be responsible for the wrongdoings of someone else. Every person is responsible for themselves. And every person has that contact and connection between them and Allah. To resort straight to Allah. 
Nani to go to a sheikh, to a minister, to a priest for Allah to forgive them. If you want forgiveness, you seek forgiveness from Allah and Allah will forgive. And Islam is so forgiving and so merciful that forgives everyone. Allah had promised that He'll forgive anyone. Anyone who had committed a major sin, a minor sin, if this person sincerely repents to God and shows remorse and regret over the action they had committed and promise Allah they never commit it again, Allah had promised in return they will forgive. So we don't have this such thing that you are doomed and you are cursed to the day of judgment when you do something wrong. When you do something wrong, you might be cursed. If you do something wrong, you might be doomed. But at the end of the day, the gates of repentance are not closed upon anyone. Regardless what this person had fallen into, if this person repents back to Allah, Allah will forgive them. And Allah will have mercy upon them. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was sent by Allah to a, to a, to a tribe of people in which he was sent to the entire mankind. But the people that he appeared amongst them were amongst the hardest and the toughest and roughest of people standing on the service of, uh, on the service of earth that time. The Arabs at that time were mainly Bedouins and mainly uncivilized people that the Prophet Muhammad came to them to change their lives. And what he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he, Muhammad, peace be upon him, managed to do in 23 years, historians, Muslims and non-Muslims, can't even, can't even, or they see that to be a miracle, what Muhammad achieved in 23 years. 23 years, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not only he changed what's in the hearts of people, but he even changed their style of life. He changed their way of thinking. He made them to be people from being so uncivilized to be people of civilization, so uneducated to be people of education. People that were followers, they became leaders. And that's what the Prophet Muhammad managed to do in 23 years. And if it wasn't for the power of Allah and the, and the, and the, the blessings of Allah upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his people, Muhammad <coughs> never managed to do what civilizations, what empires and kingdoms before him tried to do for hundreds of years and he did not even succeed. What they've tried to do for hundreds of years and did not succeed. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent as a mercy to mankind. As Allah says in the Holy Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We sent you, O Muhammad, as a mercy to the entire mankind. Every single person, Muslim or non-Muslim. Every single person, Muhammad has been sent as a mercy to mankind. But unfortunately, we live in a time and era of severe and harsh Islamophobia, in which Islam has always been the victim. And if one member of the Muslim world <coughs> commits a crime, it then it turns out to be Islam is the victim of it. If one Muslim out of the 1.2 billion Muslims out there commits a crime, it turns out to be that Islam is the one that's Islam is the one that's to be a criminal, Islam is the one that's paying the price. In every community, in every single nation, in every single cult, in every single religion, there are the good people and there are the bad people. It does not mean that if someone is a Muslim, he is a perfect Muslim. It does not mean that if someone follows the nation of Islam, there are to be a someone who represents Islam. There are good Muslims and there are bad Muslims, and we say that. There are good God-fearing Muslims and there are bad. Not that good. There are bad Muslims who don't fear Allah. There are good Muslims who contribute to civilization and there are bad Muslims who commit crime. There are bad Muslims who do evilness. There are bad Muslims who do wrong. Islam is innocent from that action. Islam is innocent from such action. It doesn't mean if some Muslim does something wrong, Islam endorses such thing. No, on the contrary. In Australia, a group of Muslims committed rape. A group of Muslims, one of them is Muhammad, the other one is name is Ahmad. And the entire media was attacking Islam. Well, you don't know what Islam says about someone who commits rape. If someone commits rape, the penalty of this person is to be executed. When did Islam ever condone or accept such an action? Islam does not accept it. This is the action of an individual. And it's not fair for me to say that if some Christian person commits a crime, I say this is Christianity. And same thing when a Muslim or a group of Muslims do a terrorist attack, if you want to call it or an attack upon victims or innocent people, it's not fair that Islam pays the price. 
Last year in Norway, we heard about some extreme crusader that calls himself a crusader, you know, breathing from Norway. He killed 77 innocent people under the name of Christianity. <coughs> Did a Muslim come out and say, Christianity is terrorism? No one. I don't accept that because I know many Christian people would not accept that. Many Christian leaders, the vast majority, don't accept that. No one came out and said Christianity is terrorism. We don't accept that as Muslims, and no one should accept that. But why is it accepted that when a Muslim commits a crime, then Islam becomes the victim? When Islam is totally innocent from that, there's 1.2 million Muslims, billion Muslims around the world. Muslims make a fifth of this world. They're not all perfect. If they were all perfect, they'll be in a better state than the state they're in now. And Allah, Allah had promised, Allah had promised that victory is not just upon Muslims, victory is upon just people. Allah supports those who stand by justice regardless of their faith. Allah will give victory to those who stand against oppression regardless of their faith. It doesn't mean that if someone is a Muslim, they are God-fearing. And it doesn't mean if someone is a Muslim, Allah will support them. The Prophet never ever mentioned something like that. But the scholars always said, Allah will support a just non-Muslim over an oppressive Muslim. It's about the principles that we stand by. It's about the principles that we understand and acknowledge. And that's why it's not fair that Islam has always been the one that's been attacked over the action of other people. When did, you know, yes, there are some Muslims who commit crime. Yes, there are some Muslims who commit some terrorist attacks. But also, there's a lot of Christians who've done a lot of wrong things. World War I was not, did not start by Muslims. World War II did not start by Muslims. There's a lot of massacre, the killing of six million Jews in Germany by Hitler. Who was he? He was also a Christian. Why is it now Islam is the victim? Not that I'm trying to put the, point the fingers on Christians. No, we don't even accept that. But let us be fair, when we try and attack a religion over some wrongdoings of its members, well, let us look at other people and look at other religions and let us see what they've done. If you want to calculate the number of victims that died on the hands of crusaders, victims who are Christians and not, not, not Muslims, okay, you'll find that exceeds a lot more greater than the numbers that Muslims did. Now that we accept that from Muslims or Christians, what's happening now in Burma, Myanmar? Muslims are being killed by who? Buddhists. No one came out and said Buddhism is terrorism, even rhymes more than Islam, okay? But I don't even accept saying that Buddhists are terrorists. I don't accept that because I know there's a lot of Buddhist people who condemn that. But now Muslims are being slaughtered just because they are Muslims, clearly because they are Muslims, by Buddhist monks. No one came out and attacked Buddhism. Oh, these are just individuals. But the moment it's a Muslim that does something, then Islam becomes the victim. We need to understand Criminals are separate from being or anything to do with Islam. If a Muslim does a criminal activity, then that's him as an individual, nothing to do with Islam. Islam is innocent from that. And the Prophet Muhammad his <coughs> teachings are innocent from that. They say Islam was spread by the sword. Bring an event or an incident that Islam was ever forced or forced people to enter Islam. Allah says in the Holy Quran, La ikraha fi deen. You cannot impose or force Islam upon anyone. Allah says that in the Quran Karim, not that me, I say that. It's very clearly stated in the Quran Karim that we cannot force people to embrace Islam. We cannot force someone to enter Islam. We cannot force someone to testify that there is no God except Allah Muhammad, his prophet and messenger. And during the time of the rightly guarded Khalifa who came after the Prophet Muhammad there was the Christian people who used to come and ask the Khalifa, the Muslim leader, that they want to live under the Islamic State and to isolate themselves <coughs> and to isolate themselves from the Christian empires such as the Roman Empire back then because of the justice they used to see within the Muslims. The justice they used to see from the leaders of Islam, from the respect that the Muslims used to give. When the Muslims came out to Europe during the Ottoman Empire, the Jews, the Jews themselves, and this is not something said by me, the Jews themselves saw the Muslims as the saviors of the oppression of the Christians and the Crusaders at that time. When the Muslims entered Spain, when the Muslims entered the Andalus, the Jews themselves resorted under the leadership of the Muslims and they saw Muslims to be the saviors of the Christians against the oppression of the Christians, the, uh, the saviors of the Jews against the oppression of the Christians. And this is not something that I said. You could 
research that and you find that the Jews themselves said that. Islam never came to force people to become Muslims. Islam came to fight for justice. Islam does not fight for individuals. Islam fights for which is justice. Islam fights to take oppression away from people. Regardless, regardless if, this, if this person who is unjust or an oppressor is a Muslim or not Muslim, Islam will fight him. Islam will get against him. And regardless, justice and peace brought upon who? Islam will stand by them. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he heard one of the leaders of the Muslims, he, he rushed into killing some people without going back to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, Qadr ibn Walid, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from Khalid and said, I am innocent from such action. Islam is not about forcing people. And if someone does a mistake, it's this person's mistake, not Islam's mistake. And we see that throughout the history of the Muslims. When was it ever that Muslims entered a land or entered a state or entered a city and raped its people or raped, raped its women? When was it that Islam entered a state and killed its children? When did Islam ever enter a town and burnt its houses? When did Islam ever enter a place and cut down its trees? That would never happen. You know why? Because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he never let this happen. And whenever he used to send out troops, whenever he used to send out convoys to go and fight in the path of Islam, he used to always instruct them, never kill a woman, never kill a child, never kill an elderly man, never burn a house down, never cut a tree, and only fight those who fight you. And those who seek peace, leave them alone. And he sallallahu alayhi wa said, I am innocent from any Muslim who attacks a non-Muslim that was under the protection of Islam. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, any Muslim that attacks a non-Muslim who is under the protection of the Muslims, I will be the one that will be fighting for the non-Muslim against the Muslim. At dhimmi. And that's why we know the concept or the term of dhimmi. A dhimmi is a non-Muslim living under the protection of Muslims or a non-Muslim who seek protection from Muslims. In Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, any Muslim, no matter what their ranks are, if they give protection to a non-Muslim, then that protection becomes valid upon every single Muslim. And any Muslim who attacks someone who is under the protection of the Muslims, the Prophet says, I am innocent from this Muslim. So it's not about, it's not about individuals, it's about principles. It's about the principles that we live by. It's about the principles that we stand by. Yes, there has been some criminal activities by Muslims. Yes, there has been some criminal activities by those who claim to be Muslims. But why should that entire nation pay, pay the price for something that Muslims themselves condemn and Muslims themselves know it's a crime? People who done attacks on civilians, people who done attacks on, uh, on, on, on innocent people, we're all standing in one front line. But unfortunately we find that the media is not interested in positive stories and positive comments as we are trying to make. They always look for someone who makes the wrong comment and make the entire Muslim to pay the price. The entire Muslims to be the victims of such crime. When we are all innocent from it. We are all innocent from such activity. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is the one that poured. He is the one that came up with tolerance of other people and other cultures. When did you ever hear 14 centuries ago that two different communities from two different backgrounds of religions lived side by side 14 centuries ago. That would never exist in Rome. That would never exist in Asia. But it existed in Medina where the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, accepted the Jews to live side by side with him. And Nabi وسلم, وسلم, agreed and put the condition upon himself and the Muslims to protect the Jews if any harm comes upon them. Until they break that treaty, until they break that treaty until they betrayed the Prophet, that's when the Prophet exiled them. But before then, there was an agreement, the Prophet accepted them. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted that they live side by side with him and the companions. You never hear of two different religions where that Christian and Jew live side by side in one place. That never ex existed 14 centuries ago. Also, what never existed is that Muhammad, in his, uh, his, his special council of consultation, his main council of consultation and the state council, you would never ever see an Arab and non-Arab sit down side by side and talk about the most important issues relating to the state. 
in Nabi Muhammad, peace be upon him, 14 centuries ago, in a moment an Arab will never sit side by side with the non Arab, especially if they are from Africa. In Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he had Bilal al Habashi from Abyssinia on one side, and he had Salman al Farisi from Persia on the other side, and he had Suhaib al Rumi from Rome, who used to be from his main consultants and from their main leaders of the Muslim army. That never existed 14 centuries ago. Do you ever hear of the Roman king or the emperor, one of his main leaders and ministers was a non-Roman? Or do you ever hear of the Persian emperor at that time, that one of his main leaders, one of his main ministers is some guy from Asia or some guy from Africa? That never existed. That did not even exist 100 years ago. I'm sorry to say that and I'm very, very sad to know that the Australian people and the Australian government just took away the white man policy 60 years ago or 70 years ago. Where's that? Where's the justice here? We talk about Muslims not being tolerant. Islam is the one that brought tolerance to people 14 centuries ago. This concept of tolerance and accepting one another, it is something that people just came up with a few decades ago. Islam has been speaking about that 14 centuries ago. When Islam is talking about respecting one another regardless of your race or your color of your skin or your background or your nationality. يا أيها الناس إن خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم. All people who have created you from male and female and who have made you from different tribes so you could recognize one another. And then Allah sets the principle and He says إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم that the best of people to Allah are those who fear Allah most. Not about their gender, not about their woman, not about their men, not about their tribe, not about being an Arab, not about being white, not about being black. It's about your piety, it's about your actions. Someone from Abyssinia can be better than someone who is from, from an Arab background. A woman can be better than a man. A man can be better than a woman. A Arab can be better than a non-Arab, a non-Arab can be better than an Arab. All based on what? On your actions, not on your race, not on your gender. Islam is the one that brought dignity and honor to the female. When now when you say Muslims, the first thing that you think of is a Muslim bashing his wife. That's the thing about people thinking about Islam. When Islam is the one that brought respect to a female. During a time that a woman has always been isolated on the side, Islam is the one that gave her her rights. Islam is the one that considered her to be a human being and made her to be from the best of human beings. In a moment that the Roman churches used to discuss as a woman a human being or not. And this is not something that I'm hiding, this is only a few centuries ago. 14 centuries ago, Islam came to bring honor to the female and made her to the level of the man and she could exceed that level of a man if she does good and righteous action. It's about the piety, it's about the respect and righteousness. Islam is the one that honored the woman when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used to consult his wives even in the most important matters of the Islamic State. Is that about humiliating women? In a moment that a woman would not even get in her, her, her inheritance. Islam is the one that enforced inheritance upon the woman. The Arabs at that time, a woman does not inherit anything from her father. She does not inherit anything from her mother. She does not inherit anything from her daughter or son. Islam came and enforced inheritance upon the woman and made her to be the respectful one that when she wants to get married, the man needs to come and knock on her door and, put her and, lay her and humble himself to ask for her hand. This is what Islam came about. And Islam also honored her that she is the one she, she can sit. It's her option to sit at home and she should be, should, be, should be treated like the queen or the princess. Well, the man is the one that should be feeding her, sheltering her, and the one that should be, the one that should be spending on her. You know, sometimes I say us, us men are the ones who are being oppressed, not the women. <laughs> she gets so much in Islam. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from his last words, from his last words that he delivered, he used to always say, take care of your woman. Take care of your woman. Allah is the one that had entrusted you with your wife before the parents had entrusted you with them. Take care of your wives. خياركم خياركم لأهله وأنا خيركم لأهله. The best of you are those best to their wives. And I am the best to my wife. Take care of your wives. Take care of your daughters. And he وسلم, also says, any man that Allah blesses him with two daughters or three daughters, Allah guarantees him the paradise. He did not say that any man that gets one or two children will enter the paradise. On the contrary, God knows where he's going to go after he sees these three young men, you know, causing so much trouble for him during his life. In the peace of Allah says that about the, 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 the daughters, the females. Any man that Allah blesses him with two or three daughters, Allah will make him into the paradise. He did not say that about the men. He didn't say any man that Allah gives him three sons or two sons or one son into the paradise. How can Islam be the one that's oppressing, oppressing, the, uh, oppressing the woman? Islam is the one that says that a woman has the right to work and if she does not want to work, she could stay at home and the husband can't force her to work. 
It's the husband's responsibility to spend on his wife. Islam is the one that says it's the husband's responsibility to feed his children. So in other words, this woman is to be treated like a queen or a princess at home. Not what people perceive Islam and Muslims are. Men are always bashing their wives. If a man bashes his wife, that's him. We have a lot of anglo and bashing their wives. We have a lot of Christians and Jews bashing their wives. We don't say that's Christianity. We don't say that's Judaism. And Islam does not let a man bash his wife or eat his wife or beat his wife or even you know, be aggressive towards his wife. On the contrary, Islam forces the man to be generous to it, towards his wife, to be the best to his wife. And the Prophet Muhammad is innocent from such a husband who's been an oppressor or unjust towards his wife. And if we see that from people, then that's them, that's not Islam. That's them, that's not Islam, that's their personal opinion, that's the way they think, that's the way they want to deal with it. Islam is innocent from such an action. Islam is the one that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, the best of you are the best to their wives. The best of Muslims are those best to their wives. The best of believers are those best to their wives. The Nabi وسلم, whenever he used to go out on any of his journeys, he used to take his wives with him. He used to وسلم, honor them. And it's never ever been narrated, ever, ever been narrated, that the Prophet ﷺ ever laid down a hand on one of his wives. Never, never the Prophet ﷺ hit him, you know, his wife. We've never heard any of his disciples or any of his companions ever, ever touch their wives, or ever, ever force their wife to do something wrong. Never existed. Yes, there are Muslims that do such an action. That's them as individuals. We're not, we don't agree with it. We don't agree with their actions. Islam is the religion that honored the female. Women were even so isolated that during the time of the Arabs, if one of them, if one of them their wives delivers a birth to a female baby, will go and bury her alive. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came and not only burned that, this is a major crime. That if the father does that to his daughter, he'll be executed in return. That's a penalty of it. A man killing his own daughter, this execution in return. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, he can about the blessings. That Allah is the one that blesses whoever He wants by granting them a male child or a female child. Both of them this blessings. And some scholars say Allah mentioned the female before the male because there's more blessings in the female than the male. And Allah blessed the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, from Khadija with two male and four, and four females. When Nabi showed humility and love and respect to his children, they used to وسلم, kiss them and hug them. That once one of the Bedouins came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he saw his grandchildren sitting on his lap sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was kissing them and hugging them. So this Bedouin was amazed. He said, "Do you kiss your children and hug them?" And Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Yes." So this Bedouin said, "I've got ten children. I've never kissed them and hugged them." So Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam got angry from him and he said, "What can I do to someone that Allah had taken away the mercy out of his heart?" Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's the quality of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's Islam. That's the positive image of Islam. Not Wallahi, when the moment you say a Muslim, that you picture a husband with a stick bashing his wife. Never ever accept something like that. I am from amongst the Imams, if I ever hear a husband, ever ever hear a husband physically abuse his wife, I'll divorce his wife the next day. I'll never tolerate something like that. And no Imam will tolerate something like that. And no Sheikh will tolerate something like that. And Islam does not tolerate that something like that. And if people do that, that's their individual actions. So the end, Message is, let us differentiate between what Islam is about and the actions of some Muslims. It doesn't mean that if you're a Muslim, you're a good Muslim. It doesn't mean if you're a Christian, you're a good Christian. It doesn't mean if you're a student, you're a good student. It doesn't mean if you are Australian or New Zealander, you're a good civilian. That's not, that's not, if someone does something wrong, it's them. Point the fingers at them. Say, this person did it. Don't say Islam. That's not just, that's not fair. Go and learn about Islam. Go and seek knowledge about Islam. Understand the reality of Islam. And all these actions, all these actions without exception, all these actions that, that you find Islam is being pointed at to be a religion of terrorism, a religion of crime, Islam is the first religion that's innocent from it. Islam is the religion that's innocent from it. And no religion will probably condemn such actions the way Islam does it. No religion will look down on such action the way Islam does it. No religion will give a penalty or, or, or will set a severe penalty or such action like Islam does. But we need to be just. When we hear something, let us clarify the matter. And Allah says in the Holy Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena aman, in ja'akum fasiqu binabain, fatabayyin. Allah says, all those who believe, if you hear a news or you hear something about something or someone, clarify the matter. It is fair that whenever I hear something about someone or I hear something about something, that I clarify the matter. And it is from a little mind. You know, it is from 
you know, a small-minded person who just takes news as they are. And the Prophet forbids us from that. And Allah forbids us from that. Allah forbids us that the moment we hear something about someone or something, we straight away believe in it without investigating. And the Prophet والسلام, says it is enough evilness and a sin that you speak about everything that you hear. Or you just listen to what everyone tells you. It's haram. If I want to be just about a matter, let me investigate. If I hear Muhammad or Ahmad or Aisha or Mahmoud did something, let me look into the matter. If I hear John or Simon did something, let me investigate the matter before I take a conclusion and before I make a judgment upon these people. And it's fair that when I hear something about Islam or Muslim, let me investigate the matter. Let me look into the reality of the matter. But unfortunately, these days, media doesn't know. Major always looks for the most <coughs> negative things about Muslims and always speaks about it. If one African sheikh in the middle of the jungles of Africa says something wrong, you'll find that Islam is paying the price over his ignorance. But when you find another Imam who says something positive, like one of the things I'm saying now, this is something that you ever dream about hearing in the media. Media is not interested in it. So many times in Australia we do so many good works, we do so many good activities and initiatives. For Muslims and non-Muslims, media is never interested. Media is never interested. Tell them something about some Muslim down the road who is isolated by the entire Muslim community, does something wrong you find the entire media is over his head. Why? Because they want to portray a, a negative picture about Islam. And we know, everyone knows, that media only gives you 1% of the truth. Media gives you always 1% of the reality. And everyone says that. This is not my comments. These are the comments of everyone, Muslims and non-Muslims. These are the comments of politicians and governments. They always tell you that media does not even give you 1% of the reality of matters and you'll be lucky to get 5%. 5% will be too much. But we know there's a lot of people out there from the Muslim community and the non-Muslim community who are wise. We know there's a lot of people out there from the Muslim community and the non-Muslim community who have understanding and they do want to see the matters in reality. And I believe many of our non-Muslim brothers and sisters here came for that reason, to hear the truth and to hear the reality of the matters and to hear what Islam is really about. If you want our Islamic history, we have a very, very, very bright and uh, honorable Islamic history that you could look into. Hear about what the Muslims did. Hear about what the Crusaders did when they entered Jerusalem about eight centuries ago and slaughtered 100,000 Muslims. After that, Salah al-Din enters Jerusalem and respects every single non-Muslim Christian and Jew that was there. Where is the difference here? Someone enters Jerusalem, kills 100,000 Muslims, later on a Muslim enters and gives respect to every single non-Muslim and gives respect to every single church and gives respect to every single cross. This is Islam. This is what Islam is about. But it's always the negative side. Always the negative side that's being always being exposed about Islam. Islam is simple. Islam is easy. To believe that there is no God except Allah. And to follow the message of Muhammad. And the rest of the prophets and the messages before him are all valid prophets and messages that have been sent by Allah. To believe in the day of judgment that every single person will be judged by Allah in the after and will be standing in front of Allah in the after. To believe in the sacred books that Allah has sent to all prophets and messages. That includes the Quran, the Palms, the Bible, and the Torah. To believe that all human beings are all the children of Adam. And Adam is being created out of mud and clay. And every single one of us is not better. There's no superiority of anyone over the other except in taqwa, except in piety, except in good deeds, except in actions. There's no, there's no differentiation between a male or a female, an Arab or non Arab, black or white. Only three good actions, only three your piety, only three good deeds, over your com only over your contribution to civilization and society. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, always recommended that we should be benefit to others, benefit others, not just to be someone who benefits themselves, but he says in the famous tradition, the best of you are those who are benefit to others, the best of people are those who bring benefit to others, the best of people are those who take away harm from others. The Prophet Muhammad sallam, spoke about the importance of the environment and the importance of animals in a moment that no one even speak about this thing. 14 centuries ago, who spoke about caring about an animal or caring about a tree? These thoughts did not even exist in the mind of people and people did not even care about human beings at that time. 14 centuries ago, human beings did not even care about other human beings. Human beings did not care about others. 
And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 14 centuries ago, he spoke about the importance of looking after <coughs> Adam. He spoke about the importance of looking after the trees. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, that Allah made a woman enter the hellfire, even though she was a Muslim, even though she used to pray, even though she used to fast, because she locked up a cat. A cat, yes, a cat. A cat. A cat that she did not let out to eat, nor that she fed that cat. Because of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah Almighty punished her in the hellfire. On the other hand, he speaks about a woman who used to be evil. A woman that was committing prostitution and the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah made her enter the paradise. Why? Because she saw a thirsty dog and she gave him water. What does that tell us? The importance of taking care of the animals. The importance of having mercy upon the animals. He وسلم, also says that Allah made a man enter the paradise because of an obstacle that was in the road and the path of people. And he also says that Iman is divided into 72 branches. The highest branch is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no deity except Allah and Muhammad his prophet and messenger. And the lowest branch of Iman, they remove a harm from the path of people. You see something that's an obstacle, you remove it. You see a banana on the ground, you remove it. You see a dirt, you remove it. This is part of Iman, this is part of, this is part of piety. It's part of righteousness, it's part of a good deed. He also says about a man that saw a branch coming out of a tree, that people were harmed when they used to travel through that road. So this man removed that branch. Just simple, get a saw and you break it down. The Prophet said, Allah made them enter the paradise and forgave him. Why? Because of a good action like that. And he وسلم, even said that when you slaughter your animal, slaughter it with the best way. And when you slaughter an animal, don't slaughter it in front of other animals. So the other animals don't see their own, you know, their own animals being slaughtered. And when you slaughter it, you slaughter it with a sharp blade. These are all things that the Prophet spoke about that, that people never thought of until centuries after that. The animal rights and this and that, people never thought of this. Well, the Prophet spoke about this 14 centuries ago. He spoke about the rights of animals. He spoke about the rights of the environment. He spoke about the rights of Muslims. He spoke about the rights of the non-Muslims. He spoke the rights of every single person 14 centuries ago in a moment that people would not even think about. And the Prophet ﷺ encouraged people to speak out, to speak out what they think, gave them the freedom of speech. In a moment that you find in Europe anyone that opposed the church will be killed or executed. The Prophet ﷺ Islam gave the freedom to scholars to speak out what they want, to share their opinions, to contribute with their knowledge to others. Even if you have any, even if you have any uh, critical points over any matter, speak out about it. Let us share knowledge. Islam contributed one of the greatest civilizations and knowledge to people, you know, for many years. But it's the actions of some Muslims that gave the wrong picture of Islam. That Islam should not be the victim, but these people are the ones who should be paying the price. Islam is a simple religion. Islam is about peace. Islam is about tranquility. Islam is about spreading. Tolerance. Islam is about love. Islam is about respect. Islam is about truth. Islam is about bringing people together. Islam is about bringing a happy and a cohesive life with one another. Islam is about bringing everyone together. This is Islam. This is the true message of Islam. This is what the Quran says. This is what the Prophet Muhammad says. These are the actions of the Prophet. These are the actions of those who came after him. This is the legacy of our predecessors. And this is Islam to our day. And this is Islam to the future. Therefore, my brothers and my sisters, and everyone, let us be just when we make a judgment over anything or anyone. Let us be just to look at the right things of the matters, not the wrong things of it. Let us look at the things in reality, not to, uh, to, 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 to uh, look aside of the truth and the reality of matters. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, Karim, inna deen in Allah in Islam, that the deen to Allah, the only religion to Allah is Islam. Allah sent all the prophets and messengers with one religion. We believe as Muslims, every single prophet and messenger came with one religion. The call to the belief in the oneness of God. Every prophet, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, all came with one religion. To believe in the worship of Allah. To worship no one but Allah. To surrender to Allah. And that's why we surrender to Him. And once we surrender to Him, we are called to be Muslims. This is what I have for you today. And I hope that what I just mentioned to you, and what I just spoke to you, can be a benefit to all the brothers and sisters from the Muslim faith and the non-Muslims. And I hope, inshallah, Allah Azza wa give us a better understanding on matters that we need to have a better understanding in. Thank you very much for listening to me. Wassalamu alaikum alaykum wa rahmatullah.
very much, Sheikh Shad for your lecture. Um, so now we're going to have a 10 minute break where um, Muslims can, who have not prayed Asha, we can now pray Asha together. And after the break, we're going to have a question and answer session. So we're going to open the floor for everyone who wants to ask um, with priority for non Muslims with us in the audience. So we can um, have a stretch now. Think about some questions that you would like to ask. Thank you.